This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Java, it's going to be a good day. We're going to jump off right off the bat because it's a call-in program. It's live. And if you've got some things you want to talk about, give us a call. I won't try to sell you anything. I won't try to talk you into or out of anything. But I might offer a, a contrasting uh, viewpoint from time to time. Uh, out of love, of course. Anyway, uh, Java, it's going to be a weird weekend, man. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah, it's it's and it's kind of crazy because, of course, there's a lot of Juneteenth celebrations already in the works, but we got this kind of funky weather supposed to be happening, yep. and so we're going to see what's up with that. But um, it's Father's Day weekend. It's your I'm, I don't know why I'm always surprised when your birthday rolls around. Yeah, your birthday weekend. <laughs> I, I've had a I've, I've had a bunch of them, but uh, that's okay. It's Father's Day too, so it's gonna be it's gonna be a good weekend, and it's gonna be a pretty good weekend to garden if you take your time and plan ahead and but what we're doing here today is just talking with folks about gardening we're going to start off right back up in the extreme not quite extreme but way on up in the northeast part in corinth and talk to is it mike yes how hey. you doing this morning Fine. hey thanks for thanks for holding on what's going on uh yes i had a question we have a good many stella diora daylilies uh-huh. and uh they seem to be going out of the blooming stage which i guess is normal and it looks like they're producing seed pods. Yeah, yeah, they do that. Uh, uh, would it be better for me to cut those back at this point in well, order for them to bloom a little earlier again? Yeah, yeah unless you're planning on growing the uh, daylilies from seeds, and hybridizers do that, but it takes like a, a couple of years or so, you know, from, from seed. And they're so easy to divide, you know, so it's just in, that, in the case of Stelladora, which multiplies pretty quick, and seeds are almost like a waste of time unless you're just a hobbyist. But it, they also are a waste of energy. All the energy is going up into making seeds instead of into the plants. And, and, and Stella is a rebloomer. So if you cut it off, you know, that'll frustrate it, kick it back into blooming again. I thought that would be the case, but I just wanted to check and make sure. All righty. All right. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Uh, when's your birthday? Uh, tomorrow, Juneteenth. Born on June the 19th. Okay. Mine's within the next week, also. Saying I'm a dad too. So. Okay, so we can have we can have a good weekend. Hopefully, it's not going to be too humid or too rainy. You too. Happy okay. Day and happy birthday. Appreciate it. Uh, is it supposed to rain this weekend, Java? It's supposed to have storms and stuff? Well, uh, uh, on the coast, it's a lot of things going to happen because they got the kind of tropical yeah. depression or whatever they're calling it down there. But um, it's supposed to. We're going to see how far. North it gets, you yeah. know, a little bit in Jackson, a little bit in Meridian, and see what's going on. Well, my garden could use a, a good soak. It had plenty of rain so far, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm celebrating Berry Day. I've had three berries in my garden. One time, I got a cup of blueberries that I grew. I got some jalapeno peppers, which are berries which I grew in Java for the first time in twelve years. I've actually grown a red tomato, and I brought it in for you, my friend. I appreciate that, man. I not, appreciate that. It's not a great one. It's not big, but it's homegrown. It's, it's all natural, and it's, you throw a little uh, salt on that, hang your face over a sink, it ought to be good. <laughs> and I wish we could spread those blueberries around, man. They're delicious this yeah. morning. Uh, in my little garden, I don't have room for uh, a lot of stuff. It's a it's a cottage garden. But I had a place I want to plant some blueberries, partly because I love their flowers. I love how the pollinators, all different kinds of little bees and different kinds of bees on it. I also, they have gorgeous, drop-dead gorgeous, brilliant, fiery red fall color. Um, usually I'm not here in the summertime, though, to get the berries. So I grow it as an ornamental plant. However, I only have room for one. And uh, blueberries do a whole lot better if you have two or more different varieties. They'll, they'll make okay by themselves, but two or more different varieties, each one will have a lot more berries. So I dug a wide hole, mixed some peat moss in, which is the only time I really recommend peat moss. And uh, and I put five different varieties in one hole, all of them sort of leaning out from the middle, and they're growing up at just one big bush. And I have uh, small ones, I've got big ones, I've got some tart ones, I've got some sweet ones. <clears throat> I've got some that that are produced early, mid and late season. So out of one hole, I've got five different kinds of blueberries over about a five or maybe six week period. And they're pretty too. Uh, anyway, looks like we've got a caller from Florence named Roger. Is that right? Roger, hello. 
Hello. Hey, good morning. Good morning to you. Thanks. What's Great going program on? program again, Felder. Thanks you, for what you do. You bet. Thanks. I've got a, I have a, a small garden in an old uh, cow tub, you know, watering tub. That's all it is. That's what I have. I, I grow my, my herbs and my peppers in a, in a six-foot diameter horse watering trough. It's galvanized yeah, well, steel. Mine's about eight feet long and oh, two feet wide, probably. Yeah, like we don't that. have we don't have to bend over. We can eat stuff without even having to bend over. That's exactly right. I got two tomatoes, two peppers, and I have one large eggplant. Uh huh. But uh, and it blooms like crazy, and it has never formed any fruit. Started blooming, gosh, a month ago, probably. Yeah. And uh, it's about three feet out of the ground and. And nice and healthy looking, yeah. But it, but the blooms have never done it. I mean, I wonder, should I have planted too? No, uh, eggplants, peppers, and and uh, uh, tomatoes are all self pollinating, and uh, you know bees will work the flowers, and it helps a little bit. But usually, just the wind, and we've had plenty of wind that usually does it. Um, and it's not so hot that they'll throw the flowers off, like like tomatoes. That that all those are related. And when it gets really really hot, a lot of times they'll drop their flowers of small fruit. So, um, I'm just, what kind of fertil? Have you been over fertilizing? Maybe because a lot of times they'd rather if they have nitrogen, they'd rather grow and they'll throw their flowers off the, if they make them at all. So what kind? No, I have of, not. Uh, well, I put some uh, some of that long. Those little granules that are yeah the osmocote right. yeah that that you know uh, it could just be because we have so much rain the way those granules work is they dissolve in water and then they push a little fertilizer out and we've had so much rain it might be temporarily they've been pushing out m- more than the plants need at one time you know and well, this it's been over the weeks it just and they bloom and then the blooms just kind of go away but but uh, no uh, uh, again the, one of the most common causes for that uh, if we can rule out uh, uh, you know, lack of pollination, if we can rule out really, really hot weather, is is fertilizer. And like I say, the granular stuff, because we've had so much rain, it could temporarily over-fertilize, like you're fertilizing more than they need. So that anyway, might be it. you know, yeah. I, let's just see if they don't settle down a little bit. All right. I don't want to plant, but they're so beautiful, I want it to grow some. Yeah. Maybe my... Well, teach me how to cook them. <laughs> yeah, good right, luck on that. Smiling, but... Hey, and uh, throw some flowers around the edge. Get you some zinnia, something like something, some lantana, something pretty that cascades over the edge that'll that not only be pretty to look at, but it'll attract some pollinators to the garden. You know, they got little ca- cascading type of uh, lantana, the one called New Gold, that that uh, or any kind of little flowering thing that'll hang over the edge of the pot. It'll be prettier, and there's nothing wrong with having pretty stuff in the garden, but it'll attract pollinators too. And I've got some four foot. Uh, 65, 70 year old fencing that I made a circle around the thing to keep okay. the deer, to <laughs> discourage the deer. Yeah, good. that's right. They, they'll find a way. If not the deer, it'll that's be the right. squirrels. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Appreciate Thank it, Roger. You. you bet. Thanks for calling. All righty, folks. We got the lines open. You want to give us a call? It's toll free this uh, classic summer weekend, even though it's three days away from real summertime. It's a classic weekend for getting all sorts of stuff going on out in the yard and around and about. Uh, by the way, the uh, the, the jalapenos I brought in, um, I, to me, peppers are, they're, they're my favorite vegetable growth. <clears throat> Pardon me. Partly because they produce well, but partly because they're also extremely nutritious. Uh, peppers have the same, cup for cup, peppers have the same amount of vitamin C and other nutrients as oranges. And they're so much easier to grow than oranges uh, here in the in the deep south. Let's, let's, if you live along the coast. Uh, but also, peppers are one of the few vegetables you can take right from the garden. You can slice them up, put them on a cookie sheet, flash freeze them, put them in plastic bags, and they're ready to go a year from now. Uh, ten, uh, in the wintertime, when peppers are running, what, a dollar fifty a piece? You know, you can put them in the freezer without blanching and all that other home economics, food preservation stuff. So anyway, I use them in a lot of cooking. I grow them. They're pretty. They produce well. They they're, they're productive in a small space. They're highly nutritious, which is a good value. And they're also really, really easy to store. I like that. Um, my native plant of the day I brought in is uh, American Beauty Berry. You know, this is an unusual plant. A lot of people, I've heard it called French mulberry or Spanish mulberry. But it's a native woodland plant that uh, tends to spread a little bit from seed, but it's easy to pull up. But it's a, a, a medium to large shrub. It's got 
big leaves, you know, oh, three, four, five inches long and half that wide. And it's at every leaf joint, it's got clusters, real tight little clusters of the most delicate pink flowers right now, which butterflies love. You know, we think butterflies need big stuff. These are really, really good for, for native pollinators, blooms over a long period of time. And then these, these uh, flowers give way to clusters, golf ball-sized clusters of, I want to call them purple or magenta. I'm not sure, but I'm going to stick with purple berries. Golf ball-sized clusters of berries at each flower stem. American beauty berry. Uh, it's a great native plant, but get this. You can take the leaves off of American beauty berry. They have kind of a, a spicy, not quite like lantana, but they remind me of lantana, but they have a, a kind of a spicy fragrance. You can take those leaves and rub it on your arms and your neck and your legs, and it will keep mosquitoes off. It's a natural mosquito-repellent plant if you rub the leaves on your arms. So anyway, American Beauty Berry, those of you who like the details, it's called Calicarpa Americana. And now there's an Asian variety. There's a there's a, a a Chinese variety that's smaller. It has smaller clusters of berries that aren't in a ball, but they're in two nice little upright clusters. It's prettier. If you think the American Beauty Berry is too big for your garden, uh, the the Asian variety is a lot tidier. It's just as cute. Me, I like them both. Uh, now let's. Uh, I can't tell Betty. Where are you where are you calling from, Betty? Calling from Houston. Houston. All right. How are you today? Up in the hills. I'm good, yeah, yeah, up in the hills. What what you got going on? The, and by the way, there's a peach place not far from me. I can't. I visited last year, year before last. They have a nice little peach orchard. There's one in Pontotoc, but there's that, also just outside of Houston, about three miles south of Houston. It's got like a farmhouse type thing setting. That that might right. be that might might be the one. Anyway, I, I got mean, I got some some uh, peaches there, and I got some honey there last year. Uh, maybe, maybe. I don't, I don't know. I've never gotten honey here. I live about three miles from this place uh, south of Houston. I have been to the one in Pontotoc. That's Cherry Creek. I, I don't remember which one, which one it was because I was, I was ambling. You know, I was sometimes yeah. if I'm going someplace, I take back roads on the way back. Well, so, this is the time for peaches. You oh, know? yeah, yeah. Well, what you got going on? What can I help you with? Okay, my son is building a house. He's a truck driver, and he's afraid he'll run out of uh, Get get where he can't talk on the radio, so he asked me to call you. Okay. He's building a house. He's out in the country, and he wants to know, he's pl- he wants to plant his, his lawn by seed, and he wanted to know if you would recommend St. Augustine or Centipede grass. Well, so he, well that, that, if he wants one of those two, it's a no-brainer because you, you can get seed for Centipede but not St. Augustine. Can't get seed for no. Nope, no. Nope. It flowers, but it you know I think less than three percent of the flowers make seeds. It's not it's not commercially feasible to have St. Augustine seeds. So centipede uh, is is the good one. Um, okay. He's up in Pontotoc, or, or not Pontotoc, but up in Houston, right? He's east of Houston. Uh-huh. Yeah, out toward, uh, going toward West Point. Does he have a lot of sunshine, or is he trying to grow stuff in the shade? No, it's it's a it's a real sunny sunny. Uh, about an acre or so mm-hmm. these build on. Well, the re- reason I'm asking because, you know, I, I like all the type of grasses. You know, I study turf management at State. I've, you know, written about lawns for years and all that. But uh, St. Augustine centipede are one type of grass. Uh, Bermuda is a different kind of grass, but it's a lot easier to grow in a big oh, area. Yeah. You know, That's the next question. He said, whichever one of those you recommended, tell him what the pros and cons are between that and Bermuda because he's got Bermuda down the road yeah. somewhere he's Moving well, in, in 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 a nutshell, centipede from seed, centipede or, or, or Bermuda are his two two main choices. Unless he goes with the roadside stuff called bahia grass, you know the stuff that's along the road. And if he doesn't mind, you know, kind of a an, you know, if he doesn't mind just mowing what grows, bahia grass, which is what's along the roadside, it does fine. It's just not a real tidy grass, you know. But if you mow it, it looks fine. But centipede, the seed takes about three weeks just to sprout. And if it gets dry during those three weeks, the seeds will sprout and they'll die. So, you know, centipede is a little tricky to start when it gets hot and dry because, again, he'd have to water it. And that's a lot a lot of area to have to water. You know, not yes. not, not water water, but it got to wet it down so the seeds don't dry out. Okay. Uh, Bermuda grass comes up real quick. Um, centipede needs to be mowed on the high side. Bermuda grass can be cut as often as you want. If it gets weeds, uh, and if he ever wants to spray weed killer, Bermuda grass will take more weed killers than centipede will. So uh, oh. if he doesn't mind, you know, throwing some fertilizer out every couple of years or so, 
uh, sometime in April, you know, and, and mowing, you know, fairly often. Bermuda grass is probably the most practical thing. And if it gets really, really dry, it'll turn brown, but a green back up with the first rain, the centipede won't. Okay. Well, that's what he wanted to know, and it sounds like you've given the answer he needed. He's going to end up with Bahia grass no matter what's it, what, what he grows, because every time he pulls in with that big old truck, it's going to have Bahia grass seed coming off his fenders. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and but but hair grass looks more like Bermuda grass, so you know I'd just go with Bermuda. Okay, I will pass that along then, and thank you so much. Okay, appreciate it. He on the road this weekend. Uh, he's on the road today. Hopefully, he'll be off tomorrow. Have you got kids? Yes, they're grown. Okay, well they still need to call dad and say hey. Oh yeah, yeah, they will. Okay, Betty, I appreciate it. And go get you some peaches. I already have. I'm going to take you to my <laughs> All right. Appreciate your call, folks. Uh, me and Java Chapman and other folks here at MPB, and, you know, we've got a lot of programs during the week. But this is about gardening, Gestalt Garden. We've been doing this for, who, 19, 20 years, something that's been, we've been doing this a Way long time. Way before I got here. A long time, just talking about gardening. People say, what do you do? for a living. I say, well, I BS about flowers. They say, no, really. I say, no, really. <laughs> anyway, I won't try to sell you anything, folks. If you got some questions, you want to solve something or get a second opinion, uh, science-based, experience-based without being profit-based, nothing wrong with it. Don't, don't get me wrong, but I don't feel obligated to try to sell you anything. Give us a call. We're going to take a real quick break and come back with uh, folks uh, again up in North Mississippi. I'm Horticulture's Felder Rushing, me and Java and the in Mississippi Public Broadcasting. We're glad to open this window for you. I'm Allison Walker, the lady auto mechanic, host of AutoCorrect. Try my podcast, AutoCorrect. We help steer you in the right direction with your car problems. Find me on any podcast platform or at autocorrect.mpbonline.org. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fell rushing. Let's slide up to Tupelo and see what's on Clara's mind. Hey, Clara, good morning. Yes, I was calling to ask about Virginia Creeper. Mm-hmm. Hope you, I hope you like it. <laughs> well, and that's how I was going to call about how to best to get rid of it because we thought we got rid of it last year from one place that popped up, and now it has little spots kind of throughout our yard now, and we yeah. keep pulling them, but they keep coming back. Yeah, there's a, you know, uh, it, people are not sure what we're talking about. Virginia creeper and poison ivy are both native vines. They're both woodland vines. Poison ivy had three leaflets. Virginia creeper has five leaflets. It's often confused with poison ivy. And by the way, I wasn't really aware of this till recently, but some people are highly allergic to, to Virginia creeper. I've never heard I'm Poison ivy, I can look at it and break out a rash, but uh, some people are allergic to Virginia, Virginia creeper. Anyway, here's a the problem. They're both woody vines, which means just pulling them, if you get the roots and everything, that'll get rid of small plants. But the older plants, they're going to sprout back out from the roots. So you need to do something that'll kill the roots if you can't get all the roots. If you pull regularly, you know, I'm talking about not just every year, but pull as much as you can, which is not that easy, and come back a few weeks later and clean up any that you missed the first time before it gets reestablished. In other words, peter it out, and each time each pulling gets easier. But you got to stay on top of it. Uh, that's one way. You can also cut it back, let the new growth come out, and is not any grass nearby. You can spray the individual plants with Roundup. It doesn't hurt the grass. I mean the uh, the soil. It doesn't hurt tree trunks. It's only absorbed into green leaves. As long as you don't get it all over you, it's not a problem. It's no, it's no more dangerous than eating a hamburger. Um, so, okay. so that's what, but the, the other thing is keep in mind that birds, you know, they, they make pretty little berries in the fall and birds drop their seeds everywhere. So this will, they'll all be always coming back as long as we got native Virginia creep out in the woods and birds eating the berries. So just kind of sort of get the worst of it under control and just stay on top of it. Well, I yeah. sure appreciate it. And that makes a lot more sense on why it keeps randomly coming up and crazy spots it's it's, re- it's real easy to say just keep on top of it but uh and that's what i you know it's 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 one of my favorite vines i actually have a variegated version that's just really really cool but uh it comes up all over the place where i don't want it from these runners and so once in the spring and once in the fall i get out and i pull up as much as i can and that keeps it mostly under control and my last quick question about it is some of them come up thorny and some don't and is there a reason for that yep you look at two different plants Oh. <laughs> There's another plant out there called Smilax. 
It's got and it it has a lot of different varieties. It's also called greenbrier, and the leaves are uh, the 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 stems are thorny. But in, you notice that the leaves on those, if you follow that back to a leaf, they're going to be single leaves, not five leaflet leaves. Okay. And uh, and, and by the way, the smilax once you recognize it. And there's different kinds. The new growth, the real tender new growth that you can pop off real easy, it's in the same family as asparagus. You can eat it without making your pee smell funny. That's funny. And not, not making it up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, good luck on it, Claire. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Yeah. You know, it's a weird world out there. Uh, I'm into eating stuff around the neighborhood. I know about foraging and uh, Smilax. A lot of people don't like it. I don't like it either because it comes up everywhere. It's hard to get rid of for that big old tuber. But if you can't beat it, eat it. <laughs> that works for me. Now let's slide over to Olive Branch. Randy, what's going on, man? Hey, Felder. Um, I've got a pepper plant. It's a poblano pepper plant. And um, it started to flower about, I don't know, maybe a week or so ago. And then all of a sudden the flowers just dropped off, but yeah. the growth continues. And to me, it seems like maybe it's getting too much nitrogen and maybe not enough, I don't know, phosphate or, or uh, calcium or something. But I have been feeding them every two weeks. No, it's some... too much. It's too much. Too much. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, peppers, peppers and tomatoes, beans, a few other plants that are native to higher elevations. When it gets hot or dry or they or they get too much nitrogen the little flowers they they don't they don't form right they just it's like they've been just snipped off and also even the small fruit but um if you've been you know if you're going to fertilize them every two weeks whatever it says to mix up use it half strength you know either use it you know less often or 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 half strength each time cuz these plants don't need all that they they really don't a lot a lot of people just grow and just plant all compost um yeah this they're so close together with the other with the jalapenos, and it's kind of weird. The jalapenos are doing great. Yeah, they're they're, they're real. Yeah, they're real durable plants. I mean, jalapenos. Yeah, they go in the back of my pickup truck, literally. And the poblanos. You know, they're bigger peppers. I don't think it's a pollination problem because you know they're they're self pollinating. We've had enough wind, you know, to knock the pollen loose. You know, insects work in the flowers helps, but it's not necessary if we got you know if the plants are getting thumped or blown around or you know shaken up. Um, let me uh, touch on something else. So a lot of people think if they put more phosphate, that, that middle number on plants, that it'll make plants bloom or have fruit better. And the truth is, if you put nitrogen on a plant, it makes them grow green whether they want to or not. Phosphorus only helps fruiting plants and flowering plants flower better. And it builds up. So it doesn't take much phosphorus, and it lasts a long time. So uh, it's mostly, if you put it out once a year, every couple of years, that's usually plenty. Uh, I tested soil from Mississippi State for several years. Uh, and then just add a little bit of nitrogen from time to time. That, that'll that do it. Anyway, right. uh, g- good luck at Poblano. There's nothing to me better than, the, than a uh, a stuffed Poblano. Exactly. <laughs> uh, although if, right, you, thank you, if, if, if you grow them close to your, you know, Poblano, some of them can, you know, some of them are, are a little spicy. Some are, are hot and some aren't. But one thing, if you got bees working in flowers, they'll take pollen from hot peppers to sweet peppers. And, and and other peppers, and it won't make the flesh hot, but it'll make the, the fruit and that little white, me- the seeds and that little white membrane can be hot. So if you got them next to a jalapeno, even bell peppers can have hot seeds and that little white membrane. Oh, I, I love it hot regardless. So I, even I, if I, they do cross-pollinate, I, I don't care. <laughs> I, I do too. I do too, man. Anyway, good luck. And let, you know, it, let's see if they don't settle down, but hold, hold back on the amount of fertilizer or the frequency. All right. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Okie doke, folks. It's summertime. Summertime. Father's Day weekend, Juneteenth. Now, and I got a question. Is federal holiday that mean Friday or Monday is going to be off? Uh, they they did the Friday because it happens on Saturday. Okay, so because Juneteenth hasn't happened yet, technically, today's not a holiday, but tomorrow is, and then next year the Friday's off. Yeah, next year, yeah, we're going to get the ball rolling next year. Okay. <laughs> well, it's been celebrated for a long time anyway. You know, you go online. There's lots of Juneteenth songs but um anyway it's been a been a time coming time coming uh we're going to take a quick break and come back with more gardening i've got some lavender i actually grew some lavender it's a big plant i can't put my arms around it because i got it in a big pot and i don't water it but i grew some lavender type called phenomenal anyway we're gonna do a quick little uh cheesy summertime ditty and we're gonna come back with more of the gestalt gardener and your phone calls right after this i'm horticulture's fell rushing we'll be right back 
Hey, y'all, I just said that we're going to have this cheesy music, and I play this cheesy music every week because it sort of gives us a break. It adds some levity and sometimes celebrate the season or whatever's going on, and I really enjoy, and I get a lot of calls and, and emails from people who tune in for the cheesy music. Here's a problem. On the podcast, because of copyright laws and stuff like that, we can't rebroadcast the podcast for the cheesy music. So if you want to hear the real cheesy stuff, you got to tune in live on Fridays or Saturdays. Otherwise... We're going to do something that nobody owns any rights to, that, that they let us play to anybody who wants to listen to. Stuff like this right here. Batman knows that plants will grow. Batman knows that plants will grow. Batman knows that plants will grow. Batman knows that Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing, and uh, we're going to be talking about gardening. I did grow some lavender. I sort of mentioned that during the break. Lavender is very hard to grow. Everybody wants to grow lavender. I, I get it. They want to grow lilacs. They want to grow peonies. They want to grow rhubarb and all these plants that don't like it here. They want to grow citrus in northern Mississippi. Uh, plants grow better in different climates, and lavender is from an area that stays dry, hot and dry, and it hates our humidity. And if you water lavender and it's and we get a rain and it comes out and steams, it's going to die. There's two kinds of lavenders, though, that if you want to give it a try, stick with these two and you'll have a much better chance of success. One is called Spanish lavender. It doesn't have that long, skinny flower like French or English lavender. Uh, it's got sort of a well, it's a funny-looking little flower, but anyway, it is lavender. Spanish lavender will take the humidity and the heat a lot better. And there's a type of, of the regular English or French, French-type French lavender that will grow here. It's called Phenomenal. Phenomenal is a fairly new variety. My friend Steve Bender with Southern Living uh, uh, tested it. I gave it a try, and I've got a plant in a big pot that I literally cannot put my arms around because it's in a big pot so when we get rain it's got good drainage and I make myself not water it. It might get watered every two or three weeks at the most Uh, but phenomenal lavender does well for me. Uh, It's supposed to do well even down in Florida. I I don't know but Steve uh, Bender says it does. Anyway phenomenal. It's a little expensive because it's a special new variety but it works for me. If you want to try to grow lavender let's stick with Spanish or the one called Phenomenal. Uh, now, let's. Uh, we're calling from uh, Craig, it says, from so, from Biloxi. What's going on with the car? Co- you getting hammered with rain, Craig? Oh, not yet. I had a few sprinkles early this morning. That was it. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering <laughs> if it's necessary or even prat- or practical to do a lot of soil testing around in your yard, and can you do that at home? Well, that's a real good question, and there's a lot of soil testing kits out there. Uh, here's the problem. They're highly variable. We don't really test soil, and I, I did this for Mississippi State for several years. What we do is we test the pH and the stuff that's dissolved in water in the soil. So to do a really good test, you need to, to, to soak your, your dirt in some 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 pure water, you know, just rainwater or some, some bottled water, and then we're testing that rather than the dirt itself. See, so if it's really wet or it's really dry, uh, you can have different test results. Okay, if, if your plants are doing good, do you really need to test? And do you need to, like, spot check it a, a piece of dirt every 50 feet or so or whatever? Here, here, here's what I would do. And uh, I, I forget, I don't know how much they charge now. It used to be like $6 or something like that per sample at Mississippi State. Uh, and you do that through your county extension. I would have it tested every 10 years. Okay. And and he, here's the reason why. If you take samples, let's say your lawn, if you take little small samples all over the lawn and mix them up really good and then send in like uh, take take maybe a pint of that, you know, a cup or something like that, uh then it represents a whole yard instead of just one sample you might accidentally hit a rock or something. But, you know, yeah. mix, mix them up for each area. If your vegetable garden is different, you know, have a different test for it, you know. So each area that has different soil or different fertilizers or different plants, whatever, uh, you know. But what we, what we want to do is when they test it, they take a scoop of that out of your, your mix and they mix it with water and they test that. See, so that whatever you send in, it's got to represent the whole area. 
So the better you mix it, the better. Here's the deal, though. When they test it, they don't test for nitrogen. Mississippi State does not. They always say you need nitrogen, not because your soil needs it, but because they just assume you do because it doesn't last long. So all soils are going to need nitrogen every now and then. It just doesn't last. The phosphorus and potassium, though, the second, third number, they build up in soils. I can I can test your soil today and tell if you use triple 13 or triple 8 three years ago. So a lot of people overdo it with the phosphorus and potassium when all they need is to do that every every couple of years or so and nitrogen the rest of the time. And and then finally, I don't want to bore you here with the details. The most important thing to find out from a soil test is whether your soil is acidic or not, whether you need to add lime or not. And it, that that alone uh, tells us it makes it worth the test. If you need lime, it lasts two or three or four years or more. If you don't need it, that's good to know. Fertilizers will work better. But the main thing is, it, it, uh, is a ho- home testing kits, they're highly variable. And uh, if you just like to mess around, you're just a you know kind of person who fusses a lot with things like that. It's nice to have a fun little tool to play with, but don't make any big decisions on it. Okay. Whew, that was a lot of ranting, wasn't it? <laughs> no, no, I was I was listening. I was taking in every bit of that because I used to test my fish tanks all the time for different things. Oh yeah, but but you know you're testing the water. Yeah, you know, and yeah. the it's same thing with the soil. People just don't realize, you know, you're not testing the soil. You're testing the what's soluble in the water. Anyway, a long story short, if you have your test done through Mississippi State, you'll get a computer printout that's written in agriculture terms. They don't break it down to home gardening type stuff. And so when they say you need nitrogen, they can say you need ammonium nitrate because that's okay. an agriculture thing. I don't think ammonium nitrate is a harsh for garden. But See if you need, see what your phosphorus and potassium levels are. If they're high, you're in good shape. And see whether you need lime or not. And those three things are worth the soil test every five or ten years. All right, that helped a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Hey, Mamie never had her soil tested. She threw some fertilizer at it every now and then. It worked fine. But I don't want to get into that because it sounds like I'm dismissing a, a valuable tool. If you're into, you know, if you're a farmer or you're trying to get blue ribbon, you're trying to manage things well. Soil tests are important. Otherwise, just give you fertilizer. It's like food. Give them a little fertilizer, not too much. Uh, now let's go to um, Oxford. What's up, William? Hi, Felder. Yeah. I was. I wanted to see if I could get some advice on uh, growing May pops. I'm out in the national forest quite a bit in yeah. more disturbed, fire-burned, piney land areas, both uh, Holly Springs, Tom Bigby, oh, yeah. uh, Bienville, those places. And um, I noticed, especially right now, there's a good bit of maypops, and they yeah. make absolutely delicious fruit and, of course, gorgeous flowers. Yeah, and they're, like, all, I, they're also a real important food source for, uh, for uh, caterpillars of uh, Gulf fritillary butterfly. Oh, really? I yeah. did not know that. Well, I I was wanting to see if you had any advice on propagating them or planting them and what kind of soil and uh, best uh, growing and moisture conditions you would yeah. recommend for growing. Yeah, uh, and and this is it's a real popular plant. This is such a popular plant. When when Europeans first started exploring over here, they were just astounded. You go to cemeteries from the 1600s in England, and they've got our native maypop, the passion flower, carved on their tombstones because it's wow. you know they have all sorts of religious implications from the flower parts and all that. But it's a really exotic plant that grows perfectly. Uh, the one I grow, um, I make sure that I grow it just like where I find it, which is not going to be in rich soil or bottom. It's always going to be in hot, dry, miserable fence row type of edge of the woods conditions. <laughs> That's where you're going to find it. And if you give it a, right. a good fertilizer, a good soil, or, or a lot of water, it's simply not going to do well. It, it, in other words, it's, it likes miserable roadside fence row type conditions. Um, okay. And if you find some out there, uh, t- you can grow them from seed, but it takes a long time. If you find some that are easy to get to, if you'll dig up, if you'll cut the plant back to just uh, just a few inches tall, and then move the roots of it, then uh-huh. it, 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 it's, it first of all it'll survive. If you don't, it's going to suck itself dry before you get home. Uh, but then <laughs> once it gets settled in, it'll sprout back out new growth. So it's wow. just like it's just like taking goldenrod, you know, which some people wouldn't think about doing. But you know, cut the plants back, move the roots in a few inches of the stem, and it'll it, it, and it'll survive. It'll do fine. Wow. But, but miserable conditions, you know. Mis- yeah. I mean, <laughs> something. seriously. I mean, uh, I, I put mine. I've got. I have a vine arbor. Entry to my mm-hmm. garden is uh, is uh, I've got eight inch 
steel iron eye beams. You know, they're 14 feet tall, and I've got them connected at the top with hoops made out of, of uh, rebar like a covered wagon. And I grow mm-hmm. all sorts of vines, uh, different vines at each of the posts. And my maypop just, I mean, it just does not stop but because I totally ignore it, just totally <laughs> ignore it. And, and that's what it likes. And if I plant something like gourds nearby, I make sure that I don't f- – Fertilize the gourds too much in case it'll over fertilize my may pops. Okay, well that's great to know. And um, uh, do they uh, when they? I like to grow through sisters' gardens with, and mm-hmm. let the beans grow all over my corn and everything. Yeah, and yeah. It doesn't seem to hurt it too bad. No, I, I, I did that. I did that myself last year. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think a may pop would? Um, hurt the corn you know if it's a pretty a voracious grower or anything it, like it, that if I were it, to it, it, like. well but the maypop is a perennial vine and uh mm-hmm. and, and corn you know needs fertilizer the idea of the, the 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 three sisters garden is the beans fertilize the corn well it doesn't fertilize them this year it fertilizes them next year mm-hmm. you know so the beans the, the beans don't give a direct advantage to the corn corn needs more water and more fertilizer uh than than uh the maypops can tolerate I so I, I'd use them as a or, or a little plant on a fence or a little arbor or a post out in the yard or something like that rather than part of the regular, you know, managed garden. Yeah. yeah. Well, one last thing. I, would, I guess you would call them a xerophyte plant. Is that is, Would that be correct? Uh, uh, what do you think of xeriscape, uh, dry, you know, dry conditions? We think of xeriscape as more like desert plants, succulents and cacti and, thing, and, and some mm-hmm. poppy, things that really thrive in and really poor extra arid dry conditions we have so much rainfall it's hard mm-hmm. to have zero escape plants here mm-hmm. but uh right. th- the main thing is just put it put it in a place where where it can be ignored and get a lot of hot miserable sunshine you know make it just punish it and it'll do better <laughs> well that sounds good thank you very much i appreciate, appreciate it. it you bet all righty folks you want to give us a call we've got some lines open it's toll free one eight seven seven mpb ring and uh we're going to be talking about gardening every week, every Friday right here, and it's rebroadcast on Saturdays. So if you want to give us a call, give us a call. Uh, otherwise, sit back, relax, enjoy the show. Thanks for joining our party. Um, I did bring in my heirloom plant today is uh, that I want to talk about is Althea, Rose of Sharon, Hibiscus Syriacus. It's native to the plains from Syria, the plains of Sharon. Old-fashioned Althea, Rose of Sharon. It's a perennial hardy shrub, cold hardy in Canada. Got big hibiscus flowers, pink, reds, whites, purples, lavenders, blues. It's an incredible blooming plant for really dry, hot, n- neglected type of gardens. Terrific plant. Heirloom called Althea or Rose of Sharon. It'll outdo crepe myrtles to me any day. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rush. And I've got some, some fun personal news to share with folks. Not that many, not, it doesn't matter to anybody but me, but, you know, I've been here in Mississippi all my life. My grandparents, my great, 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 all the way back to the early 1800s, we've been here. And I have a chance to get out. <laughs> you know, it's hot and it's humid. And I planted these tomatoes and these blueberries and these peppers and the hopes that I would get some kind of harvest. They're starting to come in, but my my figs are getting loaded with figs, but I'm going to miss them this year because this next week I'm headed back to England. In Java, I ain't going to think twice about the heat and humidity in Mississippi except on Friday mornings. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, you always have. I mean, this is I'm I'm excited when you told me the news because because of COVID and everything that's happened. You've pushed this trip away for uh, been, almost a year and a half now. I've been going there for uh, every summer and every winter for for uh 12 years now and uh but like covid last year i found out i wasn't that great a gardener <laughs> and this year I, I corrected my mistakes and i'm actually have a good garden but i'm abandoning it uh but i'm still gonna when i'm on this program every friday i'm my heart my head 
everything but my body's in Mississippi. There you so go. Gonna have, and I do have to have three COVID tests and be quarantined for, for 10 days. But anyway, I'm going to go where it gets up to 75 in the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, y'all. <laughs> anyway, let's let's go to Mass and talk with Jim. Hey, Jim, how are you this morning? Yeah, I'm doing great, Felder. Good. Um, What's up? I just had a had a brief comment about your um, comment about peonies that uh-huh. don't do well in Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they don't mostly. There, there, there are some is, good ones. There are some good there's ones. A hi- there, there's a hybrid called Ito I T O H. Mm-hmm. It was created by a Japanese plant scientist. It does beautifully in Mississippi. It'll See. die down completely. It looks like it's dead and gone yeah. in the wintertime. But it comes back. It doesn't require being iced down or put in your freezer or all those crazy things you have to do with and, and normal how, peonies. How, how do you spell that again? I T O H Ito. I T O H. Okay, because I want to. I want to get that a try. Uh, be, the, the only ones that do really well here are the early bloomers, and I've been sticking with the old heirlooms like Festival Maxima and Carl Rosenfeld. Mm-hmm. They've been grown for ever, and they're pretty dependable because they don't need a long cold winter. But this one, uh, so so people are hybridizing early bloomer varieties that'll do well in the South. Hooray! Yeah, what what I read about it some time ago was that this fellow had hybridized the tree form of peony with uh, whatever the lower growing form is, and it resulted in this one that that doesn't require super cold weather in the winter. Well, you know, and that's exactly what it needs. Most of the time, when people try peonies or peonies, as we call them here in the South, they, uh, you know, they just get whatever they can find. And most of them, the ones that grow up north, the peony society's headquarters is in Hopkins, Minnesota, <laughs> and so they they plant these varieties that do well in 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 Europe in northern climates, in the Midwest and New England, that need a long cold spell to bloom, and you plant them down here, they do nothing. And up there, they don't plant the early bloomers because it's still snowing out there. So, yeah, well, uh, I, I found this um, this Ito hybrid at a local garden center, so you, they can get them for you. If people I, are I, I will have one this fall if I, if I have to go find out where you are and dig up part of yours. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a great tip. You know, this is I love to learn stuff. This is terrific, Jim. Well, great. We love your show I and um uh, I I was hope I could contribute a little bit of a, a little bit of information for well, you. Well, if nobody else heard you, I did. <laughs> and, and spell again I T O H. I T O H. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hooray. So we found a penny that will do well here. I know of a of a of a uh, lavender will do well here. Still don't know anybody who really likes to eat rhubarb. We can grow rhubarb here, but it doesn't like it here. Morning sunshine, well-drained soil. Another raised bed on the east side of your house, and you can grow rhubarb, but if, for anybody who really, whatever. Anyway, grow where you're planted. And if you want to grow something, there's something you just got to have. Let's put our heads together. You know, that's what Jim did in college. Let's put our heads together and see what we can learn together and scratch and sniffing. And if we can show that it really works, it's not just a fluke in your garden or my garden, you know, then I'm going to promote it. And I'm going to check out this Ito, uh, Ito peony. Now, let's uh, slide back to Jackson. Good morning, Bert. How you doing, man? Hold on, uh, Jason. Oh, he's uh, talking he's, to him. Yeah, he's still getting them together. <laughs> okay. Um, but I did have a question about my uh, century plants that I got from on our, our around the ro- uh, on Felder on the road. Yeah, I got them. I planted them in the in our in my little front little uh, bed. Mm-hmm. What else do I need to do? Nothing. Ignore <laughs> them. I'll get you some wine, some little wine corks, and put them on the tip end so your boys, so your children don't uh, poke their eye out on them. Okay. But uh, basically, they grow in Texas. They need nothing, nothing. I oh. mean, n- nothing. Now, <laughs> what what is it to say when mine starts to wither down? <laughs> As, it's getting too much. You know, we, okay. We, okay. Have, we have three times the amount of rainfall those plants need to survive. Oh, okay. You know, they grow out, you know, on roadsides in Texas. Mm-hmm. So if it's an area that stays wet, you know, if you got rain coming off your roof, you know, you might want to move them way out, you know, out towards the street, away from the kids. Okay. Put them out just at where there's just miserable hot, dry conditions. Now, there may be, um, we may be on a move then because it is the bed, the little flower bed that I put them in is kind of close to the house. Now, let's, let's get, put it way out in the corner someplace so the kids know where it is and I can run up on it. Okay. That's what we'll That'll, do. And you can do that right now. So uh, 
Anyway, let's uh, if, if you start to say our, around the world tour, you know, we took this show. Let's say around the rural tour. Around the rural, I like that. I like that. Because we went to every part of Mississippi, and when we were in Meridian, wow, so much fun, so much fun. Anyway, when I get back, let's do that some more. Uh, meanwhile, let's go over to uh, Alan. He's calling from Alabama. What's up, man? Yes, sir. Good morning. Just uh, remarking on something you said earlier about the uh, Virginia creeper. Uh-huh. Uh, there's some people from up north do not recognize Virginia creeper. They think it is ivy. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, it's not. Yeah. And number two, you mentioned sensitivity. If the person is diabetic, it will it may create a dermatitis that huh. is almost like a permanent injury. It's, I've seen this once seven months and they've still got problems see so, I, yeah um, it, so it might be re- or with people with diabetes might diabetics might have a worse reaction yes sir huh. and then uh as a personal uh reference getting a big weed whacker and going after a big bunch of plants <laughs> thrown up is a big disaster but uh weed killer for southern lawns 24d and i won't call the the, the brand names yeah there's uh, lots of that makes that mixed with some ammonia as a surfactant and just a handheld sprayer will do a tremendous amount to destroy problems without destroying the grass. And one last thing I'll touch on, we all have blueberries or shrubbery that has oak, pecan, or any other kind of tree growing up in it. Right. And you can't pull the entire tree without pulling the plant. Right. You might have to have a tractor. Do it. Right, right. I got if that problem. Will, yeah, if you will chop it off with a good pair of loping shears and take a small one-inch brush and a cup with a bit of weed killer or the glyphosate, I won't call a brand name, and just take your brush directly in there and then coat the surface of the little stump you cut off with your loping shears. Yeah. It'll kill that stump without killing the tree, and then you've solved your problem. Yeah. And, and but, here, uh, here's it. Let, let me mention this, though. If you're going to do that, you need to cut and then apply it. Don't cut a whole bunch and come back a little bit later. You want to you want to apply it to a fresh cut before it heals over, because it's yes, that sir. it's, it's that light, that little bright bit of green tissue right under the bar. That's where it absorbs it, and it dries over real quick. So so what you need to do is is cut, squirt, cut, squirt. Don't cut yes, everything yes, and then go yes. back and treat. And, but, and if you, if necessary, you can put just a little bit of paint in there with it so you can see what you're doing because the stuff <laughs> yeah, is clear. Yeah. And and then you know what you've done. Yeah. And, uh, again, uh, weed killer, not necessarily Roundup also, but weed killer itself will kill with with ammonia, will get in there and kill the yeah. Virginia creeper or the other stuff yeah. without killing all the grass okay. and the decorative the, areas. The, the, the only caveat is 2,4-D, which you mentioned, it can damage St. Augustine centipede, and it can also damage trees and shrubs. So that's the reason yes, I sir, use it. absolutely. So, anyway, good tips, man. Appreciate your call, and, right. uh, and, and thanks okay. for... A whole bunch. See, if I don't know stuff, people call out. Sometimes they know stuff, and then, you know, not quite right. You know, we can adjust. So that's what we do. That's what we do. This is, gardening is a huge tent. Some people don't really use any chemicals at all. I passed vice president of the Mississippi Organic Growers Association, right, for organic gardening. I get that. So whichever way you want to talk, I'm going to go with the safest, most effective route as if it were me and my kids and my family and my garden and my earth. So that's that's the approach I use. So so I'm I'm not hardcore. So we oh, I don't like what he says because he recommended. You know I'll go with the flow. You know my job is to be a a garden moderator, and that's what I do. And we'll be broadcasting live from from England, Northern England next week. And it's okay. I'm not abandoning folks. I'm not I'm not forgetting that we're in we're in the deep south. We'll do the best we can as if we were right here. I, the difference is I'm not gonna walk to the studio every day and get hot and sweaty like the rest of y'all. <laughs> anyway. Uh, we're going to be back next week here with the, the Gestalt Garden on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The peaches are in. The blueberries are coming in. There's farmers. There's farmer's markets. Take a kid to a, to a place where they can meet people who grow and make and share what they produce. Take them to a garden center. Get them a bucket full of dirt, a couple of plants. Take them to a farmer's market and, and let them actually talk to the people who grew what they're selling. Most important, if you get a chance, help a kid get out there and do what we do best, and that's get dirty. Y'all stay safe. It's, uh, it's going to be a great